so you just finished piecing together your first quilt top. Awesome! Congratulations! Now, what do you do with it? I'm Lady Astriana, and I'm going to be showing you four different quilting methods that are excellent for beginners. These are the stitch in the ditch technique, cross hatch, match stick, and interlocking squares. They all involve simple, straight stitching and require very little planning. The description box below has the timestamp for each technique so you can move directly to any particular one you're interested in. I'm also going to talk about two specific points when it comes to setting up for quilting. The first, and possibly most important, is this clunky thing. This is a walking foot, also known as an even feed foot. What makes this so important are these little white things. Let's move that out of the way. It's hard to pick up on camera, but these have little jagged teeth on the bottom. These teeth lock together with the feed dogs on your machine to pull the fabric through evenly. This is important because with the three layers of fabric in the quilt sandwich, some of them may be pulled through at a different rate and you'll end up with a skewed wonky quilt. In general, they have this clip or sometimes it's just a bar. That bar goes under, or in the case of this clip, it goes around, the screw on the machine that holds your needle in place. And then it works with the action of the needle going up and down. As the needle goes up, the teeth come down to lock with the feed dogs. And as the needle comes back down, they go up to release the fabric. Every manufacturer of domestic machines has their own branded walking foot. This one came with my machine, so it's unbranded, but I use a baby lock. So this is baby locks walking foot. There are generic walking foots available on the market, but whenever possible, it is strongly recommended that you get the walking foot that is made by the manufacturer of your machine. A notable exception to this is FAF. If you have a FAF machine, they have a proprietary system called the Integrated Dual Feed System, or IDT, which fulfills the function of a walking foot. I made this simple four patch to demonstrate the four quilting designs that I'm going to be showing you. And I've already cut out my batting and my backing fabric and basted everything down. I probably could have gotten away with a few less basting pins, especially these around here, but I am a firm believer in the more the merrier. For a note, when cutting out your batting and your backing fabric, you want to cut them one to two inches larger on every side than the size of your actual quilt. It gives you some wiggle room when you're finished quilting everything, to square up your quilt before you bind it. I'm gonna take this over to my sewing machine and get quilting. Once your walking foot is attached, it will look something like this. Be sure to check the instructions that came with your machine and your walking foot to find the proper way of attaching it. Now my machine is set up and ready to go. I've left the tension and the stitch length and all those settings on the default of the machine, I find that these are pretty good for most quilting purposes. Now, I like to start with quilting that will secure the entire piece in place. This way I can remove most of those basting pins and I don't run the risk of jabbing myself in the finger. I like to quilt from the center outward. My favorite way of doing this is the first technique that I want to show you called stitching in the ditch. With this, you simply stitch along the seam lines of your block. Now we're getting to the end. And remember to go as fast or as slow as you feel comfortable. And now that I'm at the end of that side, I'm gonna cut my thread and show you the result. 
there's a few places where I kind of veered off the exact scene, but that's not a big deal. And now I am just going to continue the exact same way. I had pieced this purple block for the express purpose of showing you the stitch in the ditch technique. I've already shown you that, but this block still needs to be quilted down, so I'm just going to continue as planned. And take this moment to talk about the second setup point that I had mentioned earlier, which is needle size. When you're quilting, you want to use a slightly larger needle than when you're piecing. I use a universal 9014 size, which I find is pretty good. Here are the three seam lines quilted over, and you can see in a few places I fell out of the seam area. Typically you would do this with a matching thread color so it wouldn't matter as much. I just used a nice white thread so that it would show up on the video. You can see it's given the block a sort of puffed look between the seam lines. So this could be a good technique to emphasize certain areas of the quilt top piecing. In preparation for the next technique I'm going to show you, I have swapped out my top thread for this green color because it'll show up better against the tan fabric. And I have added this guide bar to my walking foot. It attaches, it has, let's see, it has a long bar at the back and it attaches through a set of holes at the back of the walking foot. I've set it to one inch from the needle based on the markings on the plate of the machine before I inserted the fabric. That being the interval I have chosen for my cross hatching. Cross hatching is that repetitive diamond shape that you see on some quilts and sometimes on store bought quilted clothing. Once you've set your guide bar to the size that you want your cross hatching to be, the easiest thing is to start in a corner and run diagonally to the opposite corner and use that as your baseline for the rest of the cross hatching. Once you get to the end, you can either cut your thread and reposition the quilt for the next line, or if you don't like breaking the thread, and you feel confident that you can, you can stitch straight in the batting and backing off the main quilt to the next line position and start back. I don't like doing that, so there's my thread cut, and now I'm going to reposition for the next line. I'm going to position the quilt so that the needle is lined up with the edge of the block and my guide bar is on the line that I had previously stitched. And there are my two parallel lines. I'm going to continue in this same way, hello Katie, until all of the beige square is filled with these parallel lines and I'll come back when I'm ready to turn around. I need to move her now. Now that I've sewed down all of the parallel diagonal lines going this way, it's time to turn it around and sew the lines in the other direction to complete the crosshatch pattern. There is my baseline and I'm going to fill in on either side and show you the result when I'm done. Here is the completed cross hatch quilting. Like the stitch in the ditch technique, this has given a bit of a puffed look inside of the diamonds. This design in a matching thread color could be useful to give an area of your quilt a simple overall design. Now we will move on to the third technique. The next technique that I want to show you is called matchstick quilting. This involves quilting 
vertical parallel lines very close together like half an inch is probably as wide as you want the lines to be usually in a thread that coordinates with the fabric this way the pattern of the patchwork is the most noticeable thing and the quilting kind of fades into the background so that it's doing its job without taking the eye's attention away from the patchwork pattern. I tend to choose a reference point on the walking foot itself and I follow that. So this is my first line and it's very close to the seam. Now I'm going to go back up to the top and start the next line. I'm going to continue the red block in this fashion and I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done. Here are the completed matchsticks. And one thing that I would like to point out in the method that I used of cutting the thread after every line is I've ended up, you can see around here, with little bits of thread that are just sticking out. Not so much of a problem at the bottom edge because this is going to be covered over with a binding. But if I go to the top, you can see I've got the same kind of thing going on. If I had decided to sew a line, turn the fabric and sew back down, I would not have ended up with all these bits of broken thread and it probably would have looked a little cleaner. This is a very thread heavy pattern and it gives the piece a very flat look. This also makes the quilt fairly stiff as opposed to what, the stitch in the ditch, which left the quilt still pretty supple. And even if I bring this over and compare it to the cross hatch, this is still a very supple, rather soft quilt. Now on to the final technique. Up until now, I've shown you fairly repetitive patterns. Now I'll show you one that's a little more fun. It involves making interlocking squares and rectangles. Start by sewing a straight line. Then stop with the needle in the down position. That's important. Lift the presser foot. Pivot the work at 90 degrees. Lower the presser foot. I need to cut off this tail or it's going to get in my way. Sew more. And just make a square or rectangle of whatever size you want. And you don't have to come all the way back up. I like to stop a little short of the line. Come over a bit more and again stopping short of making an actually closed rectangle. Oop. And continue down passing that original point, the original bottom line. And continuing in the same fashion, just making them all random sizes. And I like to come back up a bit. And this way, the second triangle, or I'm sorry, the second rectangle looks like it's interlocked with the first. I'm going to go this way. And just continue like this until you reach the bottom of the work. Now, 
Now I've come to the bottom of my column of rectangles and I want to move over. So I am going to make one more rectangle and this time I'm going to extend the line of this right rectangle all the way over. As you're sewing subsequent columns, in order, whoop, in order to maintain the illusion of random interlocking squares and rectangles, whoa, you want to make sure that you're interlocking some of them with the previous column. Right now I'm interlocking them a lot. I didn't necessarily have to do that. It's a good way to hide the layout of your columns though. I'm going to continue now in the same way and I'll show it to you when it's done. Here are my completed squares and rectangles and you can see that even though you know I quilted these in columns, it can be very difficult to see exactly where the columns are placed. This is also a very thread heavy technique. I went through almost an entire bobbin quilting this square and it's only 11 inches. This technique gives a look somewhere between the flatness of the matchsticks and the puffiness of the cross hatching, but it still leaves the piece rather stiff, not quite as stiff as the matchsticks. Here is the four patch again, now fully quilted and you can see the different textures that each technique creates. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a thumbs up if you did. If there's something specific, quilting or general sewing related that you'd like to see, let me know in the comments. Be sure to subscribe so you know when my next video goes up and I'll see you again there. Yes, kitty. Yes, kitty, get out of there. Get out of there. <laughs>